Although uh, I gathered that he doesn't need introduction, we're just walking down and uh, one gentleman comes to the other one. That's the guy who invented the ADS CFT, uh, so, uh, the, the, about the speaker. But nevertheless, I'll mention a couple of uh, things about Juan. Uh, Juan got his uh, undergraduate degree in uh, Bariloche in Argentina. Uh, then he moved to Princeton where he got his PhD and after a short postdoc at uh, Rutgers, he got a faculty job at uh, Harvard University. That led to his appointment at the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, and as you, all, most of you know, he is uh, uh, best known for the ADS cor uh, CFT correspondence, that's the uh, establishment of an example of uh, holography in, fun in fundamental physics. Uh, and besides that, it gave rise to uh, multiple developments in uh, uh, in understanding strongly coupled gauge theories and nowadays in understanding uh, systems that are related to Kamen's manner system studied by our colleagues. Uh, that's all, all very interesting. And the latest development is that uh, you can use the uh, same type of arguments to uh, try and understand uh, entanglement in quantum mechanics. Uh, that is a phenomenon that we know exists and it's very counterintuitive. And then there is a new and wonderful picture how to think about that. Uh, and Juan is going to tell us about it today. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I, um, so I'll be talking about the relationship between quantum mechanics and the geometry of space-time. Um, now, we know, that, well, people used to think that the geometry of space was Euclidean. Uh, Euclid, for example, thought that. Um, and then it was realized that uh, we could also have uh, non-Euclidean geometries and one of the simplest non-Euclidean geometries was the geometry of hyperbolic space. So that's a nice picture of hyperbolic space uh, drawn by Escher. Um, and if we, uh, if we add time, uh, we get the geometry of flat Minkowski space, so that's when with special relativity. And then uh, these two things uh, together, non-Euclidean geometries and Minkowski space, gave rise to the metric of our own space-time and the metric that is governed by general relativity where we... Ah. No, that microphone is not for projecting out. So I need to speak louder then? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll try to speak louder. Yeah. If, if, if my voice uh, goes down, please remind me to speak louder. Yeah. Um. Okay, so we have the metric of our own space-time uh, which um, is the metric governed by the questions of general relativity and we understand also gravity as due to the shape of the metric. Um, this theory, the theory of, special rel of general relativity, had two very surprising predictions. Uh, one was black holes and the second one is uh, the expanding universe. And these predictions were so surprising that even for Einstein himself even denied that uh, the theory would make these predictions. I like this quote uh, of what Einstein told Lemaitre. So Lemaitre was telling him about uh, his expanding universe solutions. And uh, he said, your math is great, but your physics is dismal. And I like it especially because that's often what uh, physicists tell us, I mean, other physicists tell us string theories. Uh, so we hope, uh, <laughs> um, we hope to be in Lemaitre's position at some point. Um, um, but in both cases, uh, these predictions are very surprising because they involve drastic stretchings of space and time. Um, now, quantum mechanics and space-time, so quantum mechanics should bear, have some bearing on space-time. And the simplest, uh, I mean, some, something very standard is to say that, well, general relativity is a classical field theory. Um, and as any classical system, we should quantize it. So we quantize uh, electromagnetism. So why shouldn't we quantize also the equations of general relativity? And it should be necessary for having a consistent framework. And it's hard to change the shape of space-time. I mean, the whole Earth uh, barely changes the shape of space-time. Um, and in most situations, for that reason, uh, thinking about quantum fields in a fixed geometry, it's OK. So that's uh, the ordinary formalism of quantum uh, mechanics. Uh, and uh, even to talk about small fluctuations of gravity, it's enough to, to take a background gravity solution and then consider gravitons and quant quantize the gas of gravitons around this geometry, ignoring interactions. Um, and that uh, can be easily done. Um, and people do this. Um, 
but uh, if you really want to have situations where the quantum effects are big, like the very beginning of the Big Bang, then we really need a full theory of quantum gravity. So for some questions, uh, we really need a full theory of quantum gravity, while for other questions, like small fluctuations, we, what we have is good enough. Now already, uh, with uh, thinking about gravity and quantizing fields in a fixed geometry, that also has led to two uh, surprising predictions. Um, so this is the simplest uh, attempt to quantize in fields in a, in a fixed geometry, in non-trivial geometries. And one, the first prediction is that uh, black holes have a temperature. And the second one is that accelerating universes, with, which are accelerating with constant uh, acceleration, also have a temperature. Um, so the temperature in the case of the black hole is uh, given in terms of the black hole size. So um, one way to read this formula is to say that the, the wavelength of the typical of the radiation that is emitted from black holes will be equal to this size. Okay? So immediately uh, you can think that if you want a black hole to look white, you should make it small enough so that its size is comparable to the wavelength of, uh, of light, uh, the center of the spectrum. That one would look, uh, that would be a black hole that would look white. And you can do the calculation and see how much energy it's emitting. It emits about a milliwatt, so it will actually be visible. It, w it would be very heavy. It would, would weigh about the mass of a continent. So it's not, it's not a very useful flashlight. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so that's uh, what's predicted by these very simple um, calculations. And then uh, we have this fact that the unaccelerating universe also uh, has a temperature. And the temperature is again given by 1 over the acceleration, or 1 over the size of the horizon. The two formulas look very similar. I've chosen deliberately similar letters. Um, but it's really the same effect. It's essentially the same effect. It's due to the presence of a horizon. Um, and we should really think of these two as more or less the same phenomenon. Both, are, both arise when we have quantum fields uh, in the presence of a horizon. We get a, temperature, non-trivial temperature. Yeah. I mean, if you're in an accelerating frame of reference, you also see a horizon yeah. light, which yes, radiates yes, also, yes. right? Yes, and you also see this temperature. So if you are accelerating in Minkowski space, you also see this temperature. And the formula would be similar to this one, so it, with the temperature will be equal to the acceleration. Uh, and, yeah. Mm. Okay, now this second effect uh, is actually very relevant for us. I mean, we, we think of Hawking radiation as not being, being directly relevant because the, for black holes that form naturally, the, this radiation would be very, very small, right? We said that the wavelength of this radiation would be of the order of the size of the black hole. So this is a thermal wavelength of a kilometer, let's say, for the smallest black holes. Uh, so that would be far below the microwaves of CMB. So it would be very low temperature, very difficult to measure. Um, impossible to measure because the CMB is much higher. Um, while this other one is actually fairly relevant for us, not, that, not at the present moment, but it was relevant in the past, and through the theory of inflation. So the theory of inflation is the idea that uh, there was, a, in the beginning of the universe, there was a period of expansion with almost constant acceleration. And uh, this, according to the classical equations, produces a large homogeneous universe. So produces a universe which is completely homogeneous. Um, and this is not the universe we are in. We are not in a completely homogeneous universe. The universe we are in uh, looks more like this. Uh, so we have quantum fluctuations. And, uh, sorry, and the inhomogeneities, according to the theory of inflation, are due to the quantum fluctuations. And these quantum fluctuations are uh, exactly the same as this fact that the, the observer who lived in that, who were if you had an observer who lived at the inflationary time, he would have felt the temperature due to the same quantum fluctuations. So that temperature of the Sitter space and these fluctuations are one and, one and the same thing. Except that now, of course, we see them stretched uh, all over the sky, and that's what explains the origin of uh, the large-scale geometry of our universe. So in a way, you can think that uh, through the theory of inflation, this is an indirect observation of um, this Hawking radiation, of a phenomenon which is very close to Hawking radiation, um, and a phenomenon which uh, is related to the radiation due to the presence of horizons. Um, and uh, now I'm going to start emphasizing some aspect of these fluctuations, which is that 
they are uh, nearly scale invariant. And so what that is saying is, is, is that the probability of seeing a very large fluctuation, like let's say a cold and a hot spot there, um, is, uh, has some probability that you see that. And the probability of saying the same structure, a cold and hot spot at a smaller scale, would, uh, would be essentially the same. So the probability of a big bump is the same as the probability of a small bump with the same amplitude. Okay? Um, that's what uh, scale invariance means. And the spectrum of primordial fluctuations uh, is scale invariant in this sense. Um, so where here psi is the probability amplitude for the shape of the universe. So it's really, um, these are probabilities for the, shape, the spatial shape of the universe at, uh, let's say, the end of inflation, or which translate into this pattern uh, for the CMB. Now, scale invariance in physics has appeared, uh, appears in many places, and um, it's a symmetry that says that if we rescale all coordinates, we see the same physics. We rescale, um, we look at the system at different scales, and the system behaves in essentially the same way. Um, now, most of everyday physics is not scale invariant. Uh, I know bacteria come with a characteristic size, people come with another characteristic size. But there are many areas of physics where we have scale invariance. For example, condensed matter systems at second order phase transitions or uh, condensed matter systems at quantum critical points enjoy this uh, scale invariance. Or for example, in uh, high energy physics, quantum chromodynamics at high energies is uh, scale invariant theory. Um, now sometimes people also uh, mention conformal invariance. So conformal invariance is a rescaling of coordinates which uh, is uh, different at different points in space, but in such a way that you preserve the angles. This is a picture of Escher where he applied the conformal transformation. Um, now, so one way of, so we, we saw that the wave function of the early universe was a scale invariant function of geometry. Um, and imagine that we had, one way of getting such a scale invariant function of geometry is to consider a scale invariant statistical field theory on a general geometry. So what we do is we compute the partition function um, of a statistical field theory that is characterized by some fields and we put it on a specific geometry and then we do the path integral so we compute the thermal partition function of that statistical field theory and we get some function of geometry. And um, if this field theory was scale invariant, this function will be scale invariant also. And one question you can ask is whether it could be true whether the wave function of the universe is equal to uh, such a system. So these are two ways of uh, getting scale invariant functions of geometry and you could wonder whether the one we get from quantum gravity could be the same as the one we would, could get from some doing a sum of this type. Um, now we don't know whether this is true or not. So in some sense this should have been the end of my talk because this is what we don't understand. But I would like, I wanted to present it as the beginning just as a motivation, general motivation. Now some people uh, think that this might be true. There is even one very special example I'll talk about in the end. Um, some other people say it's not uh, true for a variety of reasons, uh, but it's not clear whether the reasons given both by the people who say yes and say no are completely correct. Um, now what is interesting is that, that that thing that I mentioned before actually does work for hyperbolic space. So the wave function for quantum gravity in hyperbolic space is indeed given by a system similar to statistical field theory which is scale invariant. Now let me tell you a little bit about geometry. So this geometry is the geometry of an expanding universe. So this is space and uh, this is time. So space is expanding exponentially, right? This is an expanding universe. Uh, this is sometimes called the sitter. Um, now if we make uh, this time direction uh, Euclidean, we get a, a space, not a space time, but a space, um, which, which again has one, rate, one radial direction, and some of the directions of space are also expanding. And this space also has a name, it's called hyperbolic space. Um, then you can take one of these coordinates and make it uh, time-like if you want. Um, and so you get a space very similar to this one. This is called anti-de Sitter space. So here, when we did the first transformation, we went from positive curvature to negative curvature, and this is also space now, space time with negative curvature. Is this just mathematical tricks? Or no, th this is, is nothing. Some kind of 
No, this is just the uh, names for the various geometries. And yeah, this is a mathematical trick. Or, uh, I'm trying to explain then the relationships between the geometries and their similarities. I, I'm not... Uh, I mean, they're, you're saying they're different geometries. These are different geometries, but they're very similar. So okay. this one, uh, I, I'm trying to... So they're all different. They're all different geometries, but they share some similarities. And I'm just trying to point out the similarities and differences. Okay. So here in the sitter space, the, the, as we move in time, space expands. Right? Here in ante de sitter, as we move out in space, this whole space time expands. Okay? So that's, uh, you can say it's similar, you can say it's different, but I'm, I'm just, uh, right? I, I'm, I'm not saying anything profound, I'm just uh, talking about the relationship between these very simple geometries. I mean, these are the simplest uh, space times with positive and negative curvature, respectively. So this is the simplest space time with positive curvature, this is the simplest space time with negative curvature. And indeed, there is a simple relation between them. Um, I mean, this. Um, now, the wave function, so the, the statement is that the wave function of the universe in hyperbolic space can be computed in terms of a field theory that lives on the boundary. So if you uh, now have Euclidean time evolution, so now you have only Euclidean time going out, and you ask uh, what is the wave function of the universe here far away, so what's the probability of uh, seeing various things far away, then those probabilities can be computed in terms of a field theory that lives purely on the boundary of this space. Okay? Um, so in some sense, sometimes one can call this a duality because there are two ways of computing the same thing. One through the bulk and using gravity, and the other one uh, through the boundary using a quantum field theory on the boundary. And so this is, um, so in this picture you can also uh, see two kinds of figures, the, the angels and demons. And they say optimists only see the, the angels and the pessimists only see the demons. But geometry is like some kind of classical thing. Well, here, in, for, for this duality, what we need is uh, quantum geometry. So it's the quantum mechanical version of geometry. So it's geometry, including quantum effects. And you, you need that in order for this duality to make sense. Otherwise, otherwise it does not make sense. Um, so this uh, relationship, or this gauge-gravity duality, or sometimes called gauge-string duality, or ADS-CFT, or holography, is, some, is a kind of bridge, or is an equivalence, between two types of theories. One is quantum field theories, or theories of quantum interacting particles, and uh, theories with dynamical space-time, such as uh, general relativity, um, or the quantum version of general relativity. So string theory gives us a kind of quantum version, but in principle, for any quantum version of, of general relativity you can define in hyperbolic space, there should be a corresponding uh, field theory. That's the general uh, duality we expect, and what we know are some examples of relationships between two specific theories in each side. Um, now the argument for why this relationship uh, should hold uh, was uh, originally found within uh, string theory. Uh, it's based on some objects called D-brains or brains, so you don't perhaps need to know all the details of these brains, but uh, you have uh, some objects, some brains, um, and you can view these brains. Uh, these brains generate a g uh, curved space-time around them, and when you look at um, at the space-time, so you just see a completely smooth geometry. Now, if you take this brain point of view, so you could um, now, in both cases, you can go to low energies, and from the brain point of view, you have all these brains, and at low energies, you can, um, you can argue by using some rules of string theory that for these particular kinds of brains, you get uh, n equal to four super you, can, you get a special version of quantum chromodynamics, a supersymmetric version of quantum chromodynamics with gauge group SUN. And on this side, you get the near horizon geometry of this uh, black brain. And that near horizon geometry is the same as uh, this anti-sitter space we were talking about uh, times a phi sphere. So what does the word black mean in that context? Um, the, word, the word black means that uh, this is a geometry that has a horizon. So it's similar to a black hole. Uh, more precisely, it's uh, similar to a, an extremal black hole. So it's a black hole with zero temperature. Um, yeah. Um, and, but uh, this can also hold, if, if you have a black hole with non-zero temperature, then it's the same as here having 
the super quantum chromodynamics at finite temperature. We will later discuss that too. So that was uh, one original argument, and then one could present many other plausibility arguments for why that uh, relationship should be true, um, and also consistency checks. But so just to make this uh, relation a little bit more plausible, let me discuss some aspects of uh, what physics looks like in anti de Sitter space. So imagine you were living in a space that uh, was like this. Now this might seem a little unfamiliar, however, uh, you should think of this space as a space that has a constant gravitational potential in the row direction. So there is a force at every point pushing you in the, in the row direction. So if you wish, it's the relativistic analog of a constant gravitational field. So that's, uh, so if you sit at a fixed row, you feel the constant uh, gravitational force. Any observer feels the same proper force uh, going in. Um, so uh, if you put a particle here, it will be pushed uh, towards the region. So notice that yeah, towards the region of uh, smaller values of rho. So what multiplies the time direction in general relativity is, uh, um, so for small deviations around flat space, is the, gravitation, the Newtonian gravitational potential. And even in the rela fully relativistic case, when the metric deformations are large, this is still uh, governing which for what force uh, an observer who sits at a fixed position will feel. Um, so it's roughly like, uh, again, like being in a constant gravitational field. Um, now that's uh, in the geometry. Now what happens when you have a scale invariant theory? Let's consider um, you have a scale invariant theory and you make a small deformation um, of your theory. So you, could, you imagine you have your field theory and at some point in space and time in that theory you, you kick it a little bit. So you'll create an object or a set of particles that will start uh, expanding. Um, and one question is how do we characterize the simplest thing we could create. So how do we characterize these excitations in scale invariant theories? So in theories with a mass gap, uh, we describe uh, the simplest excitations will be massive particles. And a massive particle is given, uh, it's, it has some dynamics, which is essentially given by its position. And um, we have three positions, and we should also specify the mass of the particle. Now if we have a scale invariant theory, Besides the three positions, we have a size. So we should also specify the size of the object. So we have objects which can be in any position, but also can have different sizes. Um, and uh, similarly, we should specify something called the scaling dimension. What do you mean by three positions? I'm sorry. I don't yeah, so if you have a massive particle in three dimensions, you have the three positions, x, y, and c. Oh, okay. right? Right. So that's uh, just simple. Uh, this, this, this is meant to be simple. So this. Yeah should be very clear. This might be a little less clear because we are we're introducing one more variable, which is the size. So this is slightly unfamiliar because scale invariant theories are slightly unf unfamiliar, if you, but uh, they appear in many branches of physics. And those who work with conformal invariant theories uh, know that there is this extra parameter. And this, this simplest excitation is sometimes called unparticle. It's a nice name. Um, it's not quite a particle. And so an amp particle, the simplest excitation, has uh, its positions and in addition the size. And if you ask what is the simplest action we could write which is consistent with all the symmetries. So Landau and Lischitz in their mechanics book, they do this for a massive particle and they derive the well line action. Right? So that's the simplest action that is consistent with all the symmetries. Now you can do the same exercise here and you write, you end up with a unique answer. And that unique answer is this action um, for the, both the center mass position and the, um, the, this extra size variable. But now you look at this and you realize that this is nothing else than the action of a massive particle in anti heater space. Okay? So, um, so in some sense, an unparticle in three plus one dimensions is the same as an ordinary particle in five-dimensional anti-seater space, right? And this, here we haven't used anything. This is just kinematics, okay? It's just the kinematics of a scale invariant theory. Uh, naturally points us to something that looks like uh, ADS. Now, we, we don't have really uh, gravity in ADS yet, but we start having something similar. Uh, in order to have the gravity, we would need to have the proper interactions between these particles. Uh, 
And so this thing that I've said here in terms of this classical, uh, well, of the classical action for this object is also uh, true, uh, for, I mean, it's also true quantum mechanically and it's, uh, it's just the complete equivalence between the representations of, uh, of excitations in conformal field theory and in uh, anti-Sitter space. Now one way, I'm going to state the same thing in a slightly different way, so with this picture. So we have the boundary where we have objects that can have different sizes. So this is blue and red are exactly the same object, but that have been rescaled. And the idea is that if red corresponds to a particle, red cor would correspond to a particle in the extra dimension, and blue corresponds to the same particle at a different position in the radial direction. So that position in the radial direction is size on the boundary. Um, now, the way I've said it so far, it looks like any scale invariant quantum field theory would give rise to a quantum gravity in the interior, in ideas, okay? Um, and the question, so you can ask this question, and the answer is, uh, in some sense, yes or no, depending on exactly what you mean by quantum gravity. Um, so, yes, so it can be, so, so for any CFT, we would have a quantum gravity, but it could be a very strongly coupled quantum theory of gravity, which would be very different than Einstein gravity. So you can ask, well, when can uh, this uh, quantum gravity theory be weakly coupled? When is the bulk theory weakly coupled? Um, and we'll discuss the conditions for that. And also, when is it the local uh, theory in the bulk? When do we get something that looks like Einstein gravity? And we also will discuss some of the conditions for that. So let me discuss uh, this issue of weak coupling. When do we get the weakly coupled theory in the bulk? Now, we discussed uh, this uh, <coughs> some particles. So the simplest uh, excitation um, that uh, creates a graviton in the bulk is created by acting with the stress tensor operator on the boundary. So stress tens tensor operator is a theory we always have, uh, an operator we always have in any field theory. Um, and this will um, always exist. And it gives rise to the graviton in the bulk, to a massless spin two particle in ADS. Um, and Weak coupling means that it is hard to change the metric. It is, uh, it is costly in action to change the metric of, in the bulk. In other words, if we get this, this uh, partition function of the system in a fixed geometry and we try to change the geometry, that's the same as, uh, as acting, uh, that's the same as this two-point function of the stress tensor. Um, if the theory in the bulk is weakly coupled, uh, that should give us a large number. Now, if we have a field theory that has a large number of fields, then this two-point function will be very large. So if we had one field, let's say this two-point function is some number, and if we have many fields, uh, many non-interacting fields, this uh, two-point function we expect it to become larger. If the fields are interacting, we also expect it to be larger. Now, the same calculation in the bulk point of view is related to the change in gravitational action when you change the boundary metric, and it's proportional to the inverse of the Newton constant or is proportional to the size of ADS in Planck units. So if you want uh, your theory in the bulk to be weakly coupled, you want your, the size of your space to be much bigger than the, than the Planck length. Um, and therefore, so weak coupling in the gravity is if and only if this number is very large. Okay? Um, so in order to have a weakly coupled theory in the bulk, uh, we need a large number of fields. Now, we don't have to have a weakly coupled theory, but a weakly coupled theory will be more similar to Einstein theory. If we have only one field in the boundary, then we get some, some, something which will not reduce to Einstein theory. Um, now, just for fun, I, I've uh, put in some numbers here. So if we, uh, similar relations hold for the De Sitter case, and if we think about the early universe, this number has to be at least 10 to the 12. And for the present universe, which is also close to the sitter, it's about 10 to the 120. This is exactly the same as the value of the cosmological constant in Planck units. Uh, it's the same number. Um, now, the three graviton interaction uh, is also small because we are saying that the theory is weakly coupled, but it's actually not necessarily that of Einstein's theory. So one can uh, write it in general, and for a general CFT, conformal field theory, we'll find that it is something, but it's not necessarily equal to that of the Einstein theory. Um, so to get, to get that of the Einstein theory, or to get the theory that uh, has the locality in the bulk that Einstein theory has, we need an extra condition. 
So we need that um, one necessary condition is that the mass of the bulk higher spin particles should be large. And so typically, if you take a, a, a boundary theory that is free or very close to free, you um, will get operators which correspond to two fields that are separated in space. So, and those operators give rise to um, representations of the conformal group that have higher spin and correspond to masses in the bulk, to, to higher spin particles in the bulk that have low masses. Okay? Um, and those, those theories are never, never behave like Einstein gravity. So in order to have a theory like Einstein gravity, we necessarily uh, need to have all those, um, all those higher spin particles uh, be very massive. And so that necessarily uh, requires strong interactions on the boundary. So any theory that is dual to Einstein, an Einstein-like theory of gravity will necessarily have very strong interactions in the boundary. Roughly speaking, what this is saying is that when you form these excitations in the boundary, you don't have two particles in the boundary that just move uh, independently of each other. You have a strongly interacting mass that you have particles creating other particles and so on, uh, that they all move together and they expand together. They, they don't just move independently. Yeah. So this is probably a question you should ask a lot of time. Yeah. What do you mean by the boundary? Oh. Um, yeah, should have. I, it's good that you asked because... Uh, uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, so this goes back to this picture of, um, uh, well, let me start with this. So, um, When we have uh, this space, so we can go to the region that is very, very uh, far away, so at very large rho. So large rho at, is, is large rho. And we uh, rescale the space in such a way that we focus purely on these directions. That's, that's the boundary. In in the sitter space, the same would be to go to very large times, and then we look at the space, right? So that's the boundary somehow in the future. When we looked at the pictures of the inflationary universe, those uh, maps of the sky, we are essentially looking at this boundary of the future of the early universe. We have the early universe, it's expanded a lot, right? And then it continued doing whatever it was doing. And that's roughly a picture of the boundary of the far future in, of the sitter. Uh, so, here, when we had this gauge gravity duality, the, um, the, this is again the picture of the interior and the boundary, right? Uh, so the quantum field theory lives purely on the boundary, lives uh, purely on the spatial boundary. And the bulk theory, well, lives in the whole bulk, okay? Um, so this, this picture here was intended to explain why we, um, we can have a, a relationship or an equality between two theories that live in different number of dimensions, right? So here it happens because size in this, on the boundary size, size on the boundary corresponds to position in the extra dimension. Uh, okay. Um, now, there is this particular example of the duality I mentioned before, which is for uh, super chromodynamics. It's a super symmetric version of chromodynamics. Uh, I won't uh, go on to say why this theory is special, but well, let's say from the, this point of view, it's special because for this case we have uh, a known dual. Uh, and in this case, you can look at this uh, mass of the higher spin particles. And as I said, for small coupling, the mass is actually zero. Um, and for large coupling, we can compute the mass by looking at, uh, at the string theory solution. So the relationship between the size of uh, the space in, uh, in string units is uh, proportional to the coupling or this combination of the coupling and n. And when this is very large, we have a large space in string units. Uh, so a space that looks very much like the space is, uh, well, the space we live in. Um, well, not in all details, but it looks uh, similar in the sense that we have Einstein gravity and all other particles are very massive. In particular, this higher, this spin four particle is very massive. As in nature, we don't have uh, this uh, light spin four particles. Um, and here we see that as we increase the coupling, it was possible, is it possible to do the computation and find uh, the whole curve and see how, as you vary the coupling, the mass of these states uh, grows. And there's a whole interesting technology that was developed using integrability, and it translates into a solution for the anomalous dimensions for the theory, for the, for operators in this n equal to 4 super theory. Um, 
Now, this fact that uh, a theory that has ordinary Einstein gravity corresponds to a strongly coupled theory uh, is uh, useful because um, strong, strongly coupled field theory problems get translated into simple gravity problems, right? I mean, of course, this only works for very special field theories, but even for these special field theories, it translates strongly coupled uh, problems or complicated problems into simpler problems, okay? Um, and rather than describing the applications, one could ask why, why could strong coupling simplify the problem? So wh what are examples of theories where having some strong coupling simplifies a problem? So and a simple example is, uh, imagine you have a gas of particles, right? Um, and you want to describe it. So we know that if the particles are somewhat coupled to each other, then we can describe it using hydrodynamics. But you need strong interaction strong enough interactions to, for the gas to thermalize and to be described by thermodynamics. If the interactions are not strong enough, then you need to go back to Boltzmann equation. But if the interactions are strong enough, then you can, um, but not too strong, then you can uh, describe it using hydrodynamics. So here, gravity is somewhat analogous to a kind of hydrodynamic approximation. So we keep some low energy modes, and we throw away all the rest. Um, and that's a... Uh, how this is essentially working. And this can be used to model uh, various systems, and I, I won't describe them in detail. Um, now, some, something interesting is to consider the finite temperature configurations that I briefly mentioned before, and they correspond to black holes in the interior. So if you have a black hole in the interior, that's the same as uh, having a system of um, thermal particles on the boundary. Um, and in gravity, we can compute the entropy of the black hole. We can assign an entropy to a black hole uh, given by the area of the horizon and in Planck units. And in field theory, this, this entropy turns out to be equal to the statistical entropy in the boundary theory. So um, I mean, it was a bit mysterious what this uh, entropy is really counting and whether it really should be thought of as an entropy at all um, when it was first proposed, this, this gravity entropy. But here, in this uh, duality, there is a very concrete uh, field theory entropy that is supposed to be the same as the entropy of the horizon, and it's just the ordinary statistical entropy of the gas of particles on the boundary. And furthermore, the whole evolution of this black hole, if you describe it from the boundary point of view, it's unitary, as seen from the outside. So if you, if you accept this uh, gauge gravity duality, and uh, then there is uh, no information loss due to black holes. So as you um, see the black hole from the outside. The black hole is being described uh, by a unitary system. What is the unitary system? Well, the unitary system is this field theory that lives on the boundary of space. So you not only describe the black hole, but you describe the whole space-time inside uh, the whole space-time inside this boundary. So with this said, I should say that there are still many some problems. We still don't understand how to describe the interior and how to describe the interior even if you accept the gauge gravity duality, so how precisely the interior is embedded. Um, now, there's an interesting connection between black holes and hydrodynamics. So the, the field theory at finite temperature is related to a black brain in anti, in anti Sitter space again. So we have the directions of space, and uh, we have the extra dimension, and then we have, instead so of a black hole, we have a black brain. And then we can consider small ripples on the black brain. And those correspond to the hydrodynamic modes of whatever plasma we have here on the boundary. Um, and then absorption into the black hole corresponds to dissipation or viscosity. Um, and one can calculate these coefficients of dissipation or viscosity by solving the wave equations in this background. The, the calculation of those coefficients in the boundary theory would typically be very difficult. But here they get translated into a simple problem. So this is one particular example where something complicated becomes simple. And in, if you look on these very long distance modes, you find that the Einstein equations reduce to uh, the equations of hydrodynamics, just ordinary. Well, first uh, they reduce to the equations of relativistic hydrodynamics, and you can further take even a lower energy limit where they reduce to the usual standard and textbook uh, Navier-Stokes equations. Um, and this was done by many people, some of, some of which I, I mentioned here. Um, Now, one, one of the lessons of uh, this relationship between gravity and uh, geometry um, 
between gravity and well, quantum mechanics and gravity and the gauge theory is that the entanglement pattern present in the state on the boundary theory in some cases can translate into simple geometrical pictures uh, in, in the interior. And one of these is, for example, the entanglement entropy for a region. So in a quantum field theory, so we have a quantum field theory here defined on the blue line, and we consider the vacuum state in this quantum field theory. So in the vacuum state, uh, we can think of, um, of the local degrees of freedom that describe this theory. And if we consider a sub-region, there will be a non some entanglement entropy, so the, the, the region, the degrees of freedom in a sub-region will be non-trivially entangled with the degrees of freedom in the outside, even in the vacuum, and that's actually an important property of the vacuum. And that entanglement, um, in general, in quantum field theories is difficult to calculate, but in quantum field theories that have a gravity dual, then it is easy to calculate. It can be calculated by looking at the area of a minimal surface that uh, is extended into the bulk. So this is uh, a kind of generalization of the Bekenstein-Hawking formula for black hole entropy. So in Bekenstein and Hawking, we calculate the entropy of uh, the, the, the area of the horizon of a black hole. And we can interpret that as, that as the entanglement of what's outside with what is inside. But here, uh, for any region on the boundary, we can define this minimal area surface. And for that, we can assign this entropy, and which has a well-defined boundary geometry. Uh, boundary interpretation. Now perhaps the most dramatic example of this is uh, when you have uh, uh, the so-called eternal ADS black hole. So you have two ADS spaces, two separate ADS spaces, and you have a black hole uh, in them. And you have this particular geometry. So this particular geometry consists of uh, two boundaries. So we have two separate boundaries, uh, two separate field theories. The field theories are not interacting. But we have an entangled state in this field theory, which, um, which has this specific form. So this is a very peculiar entangled state people sometimes consider. Uh, it's called the thermofield double. It has the property that if you make observations only on the right side, uh, those observations agree with the ones you would get in a thermal ensemble. In other words, if you neglect completely the left side, the density matrix you, hear, you get on the right side is the thermal density matrix. Okay? So we have a pure state in these two field theories. Um, and that this, the, the idea is that this pure state corresponds to a geometry which is actually connected between the two sides. So the connection between, geometric connection between the two sides is not due to some dynamical interaction between the, the two field theories, but is uh, due to the entanglement that present in this particular state. Um, okay. And so we can, uh, similar geometry is the geometry of uh, the eternal Schwarzschild solution. So it also has, um, it, it also has a similar geometry. So here we have uh, the exterior of a black hole. Yeah, I should mention this is just the simplest black hole so spherically symmetric solution of GR. So if you take general relativity and you look at the simplest spherically symmetric solution, which is not flat space, is this one. Okay. So the question is, what is the physical interpretation of the solution? So let me first describe the solution. So we have, um, this is flat space far away. So this is uh, R4, Minkowski 4, four dimensional Minkowski space. Um, as you approach this surface here, you see a black hole. These two lines are the black hole horizon. This whole thing is the exterior of uh, this black hole. Here you have a second uh, Minkowski space, completely unrelated to the first Minkowski space. And you also have a black hole horizon. So this whole region here looks like the exterior of a black hole. And this whole region here lo also looks like the exterior of another black hole. But the in these black holes are connected through the interior. So this region here is like the interior of a black hole. And they, these two black holes share this interior. The interior is common for the two black holes. Okay. So that's just, I'm, all, all I'm doing here is just describing this geometry. Just the simplest uh, solution of uh, Einstein's equations. Um, now, we, we can uh, interpret also this geometry as an approximation. So if you only look at the region near the horizon of another geometry, which uh, we can view as a wormhole. So if we have 
two separated, so you can consider a geometry the following other geometry. The now, now I'm going to discuss a different geometry, which uh, contains two black holes. The two black holes are uh, very separated from each other, so that around each black hole it looks like we have flat space, right? And now we connect uh, the interior of the two black holes in the same way that they are connected through in this in this eternal Schwarzschild solution. Okay, so we can f find that that uh, configuration, and it will be a solution of uh, the Einstein uh, Einstein's theory, and it's a particular solution. And this is uh, sometimes called the wormhole uh, because if we look at uh, this spatial section, so we can. Um, we can go into the interior of this black hole uh, that going to the interior of this black hole along a spatial section at constant time is like coming here and then uh, we, if we continue we emerge in the exterior of this other black hole okay so we um, along you a spatial do that without doing something a causal I mean you can't take a material object and do that no 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 we'll, we'll, we'll discuss how, how to do it but um, what I'm saying now, I'm just describing the geometry, right. and uh, um, what I'm saying is the behavior of, of, a, of a trajectory which is space-like. So this is not the behavior of someone who can fall in. We'll, I'll discuss in a second what someone that falls in will see. But I'm just trying to describe the geometry at a fixed time. So the geometry at a, at, at a fixed time is connected between the two sides. Right. So we have. Uh, instantaneously at this time we have a wormhole connecting the two sides um, now uh, if you are a material if you are someone who really lives here and tries to go in s into this wormhole what will you see so you 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 cannot follow the space space like trajectory you have to follow a time like trajectory so you'll have to follow a time like trajectory and no matter how much you try to move to the left you can never uh, come out. You will always end up here at the singularity. So a, a real observer who tries to go through the wormhole cannot go through the wormhole. Um, the wormhole closes, uh, closes on him or her. So this is at this singularity the two sphere uh, shrinks to zero, right? So the worm you can interpret that as saying that the wormhole closes. Another thing you can say is that there are these two horizons and they are touching at t equal to zero but they start moving away from each other. And when an observer moves, crosses the first horizon, the second one starts moving away at the speed of light, and the observer can never catch up with this one and can never come out. Okay. Um, now, something that is, is possible is to do the following. So you, you can be a person outside this black hole, and you can have a friend who is outside the other black hole. And if both of you jump in, you can meet in the interior after a very short time. So you have to pre-arrange that you are going to meet, but um, <laughs> you, you have to do this pre-arrangement, but even then, you are very far away, and you jump in, and you meet. So uh, what I'm trying to emphasize is that the fact that the geometry is connected has some consequences. It's not that even though you cannot go from one to the other, uh, this, you can arrange for a meeting inside. Now, you cannot tell anyone uh, outside about this meeting. So it's a very secret meeting, <laughs> but also fatal. <laughs> um, okay, so the idea, so when Lenny Saskin, we propose this idea that we, um, well, we invented this acronym which says that ER is equal to EPR. Now, ER is this, the, this spatial slice is sometimes called the Einstein Rosen bridge because Einstein and Rosen noticed that the eternal Schwarzschild black hole has this geometry. Sorry, but here you also can connect L and R staying outside. Of yeah, thing. yeah. So here you can take the long, long way out, right? And you can go from. But the interesting thing is that you can also go inside through the short way, right? Not below, right? Not in the. No, not in this diagram. So that's so. Th th this, these two are similar only in the region near the horizon. Far away, they are connected. So there is a, a further connection outside here. The problem is to to draw the causal diagram of this situation would require more than two dimensions. So. That's why I've st stuck with this one. Um, so if, if, if you are here and your friend, so, so let, let me say this a little more graphically. So suppose we can, we, this, this geometry would be saying that we can have a black hole here. Uh, we can have another black hole in the Andromeda galaxy. And we synchronize with this friend in the Andromeda galaxy that we're going to jump into the black hole at the same time. Um, 
and then we jump in and we immediately meet uh, inside this black hole. Okay. So that's what's possible with this geometry. Now I'm not telling you how to make this geometry, so making this geometry is a whole other problem. Um, so, but the idea is that uh, this wormhole geometry uh, should be equal to an EPR pair of two black holes but in a particular entangled state. So in the entangled state I, I wrote in the a few transparencies ago, that, that thermophile double state. So each black hole is supposed to, by the Hawking-Beckenstein Hawking entropy formula, is supposed to have a, a finite number of degrees of freedom as seen from the outside. Okay? And then you take these uh, two black holes and you put them in this particular entangled state where uh, they are entangled in this particular way. And the idea is that that, uh, that entangled state will be described by the geometry I mentioned, by the wormhole geometry. Okay? So the geometry of space-time depends on how the black holes are entangled. If, if we didn't entangle them in this state, we entangled them in a different state, then the geometry in the interior would look different. Um, or if they are not entangled also, there would not be any connection between them through the interior. The connection in the interior only arises because of the entanglement. Um, so the conclusion is that these large amounts of entanglement can give rise to this geometric connection. And if one accepts very quantum geometries, then even the spin a half entangled states could be connected by tiny quantum wormholes in some sense. Now the fine print here says that this is not very meaningful because we don't have a way to define quantum gravity for these spin a half systems. Um, and the exercise, yeah, go ahead. Why can't you just think about these coupled black holes in a completely classical way? I mean, coupled by? These coupled black holes. In a yeah. In a completely classical way, like why, why are we talking about quantum mechanics? Right. Is, right. The, is, is that a solution to the GR without any quantum fluctuations? Right. The, 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 this geometry is a solution to GR without any quantum fluctuations. Right. Okay. Yes. But um, the idea is that what this solution represents is um, an entangled pair of two black holes. So, so the I'm trying to put together uh, that geometry with the fact that black holes have a finite number of states. Right? So black holes fi have a finite number of states, but it's very large. In the classical limit, it's infinite. Okay. Okay. So you're quantizing. GR. So we are quantizing. We're having a finite Newton constant, okay. and then that geometry is, is this entangled state between two black holes. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, that's uh, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. And if these black holes were not entangled. Uh, they, would look, they could look identical from the outside, but they, they would not be connected through the inside. They are only connected due to this entanglement. So in other words, the, the fact that geometry is connected is not related to a dynamical interaction between these two, between the degrees of freedom of each of the black holes. It's only due to the entanglement between the degrees of freedom. Notice that these properties, that the wormhole is not traversable, that we cannot send the signal from one to the other, and, and that there is no causality violation, right? So it's even so here it looks like uh, we can. There is a short spatial distance between these two, right? And one might be worried that we can send signals faster than light, but it's not possible. There is no causality violation. All these properties are shared by entanglement. In entanglement, we cannot send signals and so on. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. And the final thing is, the, well, okay. I, I was. Uh, describing how this could uh, work in more generality and the, the real answer is we don't know. And the exercise is to uh, define quantum gravity in such a way that uh, the shape of space-time comes out of entanglement in some way, or that entanglement plays a huge role in the shape of space-time. So I started the talk by mentioning uh, that in quantum gravity, small fluctuations, right? We can take the, the space-time and consider in small fluctuations and even that is relevant for us because uh, of the beginning of the universe, etc. But in quantum gravity, we can have even more dramatic things. We can have situations where just purely entanglement creates a geometric connection. So a connection between quantum mechanics and geometry is not just simply that we just need to quantize, uh, quantize small fluctuations around the classical geometry. Quantum mechanics has uh, this very important... So geometry is characterizing properties of entanglement and other uh, properties of quantum mechanics that um, that we're only only beginning to understand, and we, we don't know how to put this together in a, in a 
complete theory. Um, but probably will have important uh, consequences. So the, in conclusions, I, I made some points. So one is that the cosmic scale invariance that we see in the sky, that, we, that you, whenever you hear cosmology talk, they will talk about scale invariant spectrum of fluctuations. Uh, that's the same as the scale invariance that we see in the quantum field theory example. So it's the same type of symmetry. Uh, we don't know whether this uh, is completely, whether it's due to, is equally one and the same, but the type of symmetry is exactly the same. Um, we said that in the case of quantum hyperbolic space, then indeed one can relate the two in a precise way, and one can relate the scale invariance of field theory to the scale invariance of having hi quantum hyperbolic space. Um, we mentioned that these are, that these are models for str strongly interacting quantum systems. Um, and this gives a complete description of black holes as seen from the outside. And also finally we mentioned that uh, large amounts of entanglement can give rise to co geometric connections, summarized in this uh, acronym. That if we drop uh, Podolsky here, we have an equivalence. Um, he was a spy anyways. What? He was a spy anyways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and well, I, I guess for the future, uh, what we should say, we are only a sign away from understanding the Big Bang singularity. Because we, all we need to do is go from negative curvature to positive curvature. And indeed, there is one interesting example of higher spin, with higher spin gravity, which, which uh, has a dual, which is free theories, as I was mentioning. Free theories are related to theories where the higher spin particles are massless. Uh, but so far, we don't have any example with Einstein gravity yet. Um, now, it would be interesting to understand classifies conformal field theories which give rise to large universes. And it would be nice to understand better how back locality emerges from the boundary theory, understand how to describe the interior of black holes and solve uh, various black hole information paradoxes. Um, and some of the lessons is that space-time is, emerges as, space -time is an emergent concept and that even space-time can come from entanglement. Does it, is it always the case? Is it true only in specific cases? Uh, we don't know. Well, thank you. Questions, yeah, Massimo. Mm -hmm. um, in one uh, proposal that you had a few years ago of yeah. explaining the unitarity of yeah. black yeah. evolution, there mm -hmm. was uh, the final state that acted. Mm -hmm in mm -hmm. a sense, as a teleporting scheme, right? Right, uh, right, uh, right, a, a right. EPR pair, uh, some right, right, some right, thing. right, right. Mm -hmm. If the uh, measurement of the mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the particle didn't agree, you erase the past, right? Mm -hmm. you want to keep right, right, the right, 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 in right. Some sense. Now, here you have an EPR pair that's macroscopic, mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Can't you think of some scheme in which you have teleporting for these black holes by measuring the walking radiation on one side or on the other? Well, the, the, the ordinary teleporting need, needs you to send, send the classical signal, yes. right? Because uh, you don't have this final state boundary condition usually. So you really need to, in order to teleport something, you need to. So yeah, in principle, it could be possible to do a measurement of one black hole and then send the classical signal and the other person can reconstruct a certain complex quantum state. That, that sounds perhaps possible. Uh, so wh when I said possible is, uh, I think it is possible if you're allowed to do arbitrary, co complicated operations on these black holes. Um, now, some people have, Hayden and Harlow have, have suggested that perhaps there is a fundamental computational limit on the things you can do. And that uh, there are some things which are so complex that you cannot possibly do them. Uh, so. uh, what do you mean by saying we are a sign away from yeah, so if, if the universe was anti-decitors, was had negative curvature, um, then we would understand um, the universe in terms of uh, field theory living in the, uh, on the boundary. Now, um, we, we are not in anti sitter and decitor, so it, it's the opposite sign of the curvature. Uh, that's what the, sign, the word sign means. Um, and if we had an understanding similar to the one we have in anti sitter we would say that we would be able to calculate the probabilities that for everything that could happen in the far future um, in terms of uh, field theory that lives in the far future. That's, uh, that's the idea. Well, 
But is it a very specific state with high entanglement that corresponds to this wormhole geometry? Or is it yeah, yeah the, 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 this, this wormhole geometry is one unique uh, state. Right? If you change the state a little bit, uh, then it the, the wormhole geometry the wormhole will be changed. For example, a simple way to change it is to introduce extra particles coming out of the singularity and going into the future singularity. Um, as another special feature of this wormhole is that the two horizons <coughs> touch. So if you consider more complicated states uh, or simple ones, you, you see that the two horizons start moving away from each other. Um, so the, most, the more generic uh, state will be, and there are some arguments that say that if there was a wormhole connecting two for, for generic entangled states, the wormhole should be very long, if it exists at all. So this also means that if you could somehow create the state with the black hole here and the black hole in the ground, that the wormhole in a very short period of time, the wormhole will, uh, will grow very long because of the interactions? Well, in some sense, we, we, are, we are more or less saying that in the... Um, so already in this picture, uh, well, maybe I should go to the... More, yeah. Already in this picture, we are seeing that the two horizons touch here, but as you move to the future, imagine we are looking at this time, the two horizons are further away from each other, right? And they are, the time evolution to the future puts some faces in the, in the state I was discussing be before. But this state is still special because there was one time at which the two horizons touched. But there are more generic states where there are, there's no time where the two horizons touch, and the two horizons are really separated from each other at the space-like distance. So these two vertices are at uh, separated by a space-like distance. So this is definitely a very special state, but uh, yeah, so the question is what's the generic? So one question we don't know the answer to is what if I have two black holes which are entangled but in a generic state? Can we say anything about the geometry connecting them or, or yeah, so that's uh, something we, we don't know the answer to. Or can, is it meaningful to assign them a geometry? So we know if we try to be constructive, right? We know how to create a black hole. We yeah. just yeah. take a star, yeah. it mm -hmm. collapses, creates yeah. a black hole. Right, right. How do I create two black holes which share are maximally the entangled? Interior? Yeah. <laughs> so you first of all if, if if you were just to take two stars and collapse them, when when you create a, co a star and collapse it, it, it increases the entropy, right? Um, here the, the states are very fine, fine, very correlated between the two sides. So if you're going to do it at all, you should do it very slowly. You should uh, build the black hole up very slowly, sending correlated photons in the two black holes. You have to split a black hole somehow, right, to create this thing, in a sense. Well, let's say you start with two tiny little black holes and you start sending Hawking radiation. Well, you, you start sending radiation, which is entangled between the two sides. And this way you start building up the two black holes. That's uh, one way you might imagine doing this. Th there is another, I mean, there is another process that creates black holes in a state like this, which is uh, the following. So I imagine you have pair creation, just of uh, ordinary, uh, ordinary pair creation. Um, so then um, imagine you have several flavors of electrons that you could pair create, right? Then if you pair create an electron-positron pair of one flavor, right? Uh, if you have flavor one here, you'll have flavor one on the other side, and flavor two one side, flavor, right? The flavors are going to be correlated. So when you do pair creation, uh, typically the internal states are correlated of the things that you pair created, okay? I mean, you can see this more precisely in the Euclidean diagram. I don't want to get very technical, right? Is that uh, clear? So they, they would, uh, the internal states would be uh, correlated. And so you can consider um, pair creation of black holes, of magnetically, of, let's say, magnetically charged black holes. Imagine you had a constant magnetic field. Uh, if you create a pair of black holes by tunneling. But basically, I'm saying if you create a pair of perfectly entangled black holes, they will have to share a common field. Yeah, I'm saying more than this. So if, if you look at the process that gives you the uh, pair creation rate for black holes, the dominant pair creation rate for, for a black hole of a given size is given by a geometry where the black holes are, when they are created, they are connected in this way. 
So that's in, in some sense a natural way of, con of making them. Of course it's pair creation, so it's exponentially suppressed. You would have to put in your magnetic field and sit down forever to expect uh, to get the black holes uh, created. Right? Yeah. Is there a measurement I could do to tell if two black holes are correlated? Yes, yes, that, that can be uh, done easily. So if you have the two black holes, you can uh, measure, for example, the expectation value of the field here and the expectation value of the field on the other side and then you compare the two answers. So in the case that we said of the black hole here and one in Andromeda galaxy, our friend measures the value of the fields uh, at some point in space time that we previously agreed near his black hole. And I do the same here for my black hole. And then a while later we compare the measurements and if they are related in this way, we, we expect a particular correlation. So you hover in your spaceship, sort of just outside yes, the horizon yes, yes. of these two black holes yes. and, and measure the yeah, and you measure the value of uh, some field, let's say the electric, electromagnetic field. Coming out of the black hole. The yes, 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 yes. Yeah. It's a thermal the atmosphere. E each from, if you only look at the measurements on each side, it will be random, right? It will be like measuring one spin of an entangled uh, pair. It's completely random, the answer you will get from each side. But then when you compare the two sides, you'll find that they are correlated. Of course, you will have to send the signal. So it will take the two million years or whatever it takes <laughs> to go to Andromeda Galaxy to, for us to compare. So like the polarization. Yeah, exactly. So we look at a particular Hawking photon, and I measure polarization here. The other guy measures polarization, um, the, the same Hawking photon located in the same relative point in this space, and uh, we would see a correlation. Uh, uh, what is the interpretation of singularity? Uh, there is no, no interpretation. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's, it's a negative statement. I don't have anything useful to say. Let, let me propose to take this interesting conversation to six floor over wine and cheese and thank you all. <laughs>